Hello, Daniel. Good to see you again. Thank you. Thank you for uh, having me. So um, I'm Adam Saffron, and this is Daniel Polani. And we're continuing a conversation on um, the nature of empowerment drives for both natural and artificial intelligences and um, their potential implications. OK, so when we ask this question about why, why do we do this, I would say it's important to ask the question, why do we do this? And essentially, the reason why we are are asking this is because when we look at evolution, evolution in the, in the naive, naive evolutionary argument say, okay, you have this mutation, they get you somewhere and then selection picks out the good solutions. But uh, when we look at that, uh, the space is pretty big and it's pretty unconstrained too. So we feel that this is not enough. It is not sufficient to just look at um, the question of um, evolution somehow solves it. It's a little bit a cop out. It's a little bit of, um, of an incomplete statement. And the argument that essentially my collaborators, my colleagues and myself put forward is that information is at the heart of all these arguments. Information means we're talking about, um, you know, Shannon information essentially but maybe other types of information too. Um, so the question really that we are, we should be asking is, what is it that um, all organisms enjoy or can exploit as a source of direction? And the argument is information is something that every organism that does even minimal decision-making, right? Whether pro protein has to decide whether to fold or not to fold, for example, has to process information. And if you think of an, an evolution being driven by informational considerations, suddenly many things become easier to understand or more plausible, easy to explore. And it's more clear how evolution could actually be able to explore all these weird, these weird, um, very, very successful strategies that it ends up exploring. So, you just yeah. said um, this might also relate to other kinds of information, not necessarily just Shannon information. Can you say a little more on that? Well, I just don't want to exclude it. I mean, um, there are, of course, Rennie entropies and Salis entropies, and they are all kind of related. Um, there are interesting relations coming from, um, which you can see in the information geometry. The information geometry is actually quite a good way of seeing the links between all these different types of um, information measures, uh, because information geometry has a rich set of um, connections and geodesics and, and structures, which uh, give us a good feeling for what type of um, what type of the dynamics you may want to consider. However, uh, my personal favorite is and remains Shannon information. And uh, I have this, this little joke or anecdote that I tell where somebody many, many years ago Ask me, why don't you use something else? You know, Euclidean distance or some kind of simple metric. Why, why does it have to be Shen information? And I made this quip. And I, the, the quip was because there are more theorems for Shen information. So in a way, Shen information compared to all these other types of um, measures has simply more things that are true for it, that are valid for it. It is numerically actually one of the nastier to compute. So there are much nicer variants of information, Rennie entropies that are much easier to estimate than Shannon. So Shannon is actually extra nasty to compute numerically, but conceptually it is probably the one that has the most obvious and most simple things going for it. But this is not really an argument. It's 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 not even um, neither a scientific nor a mathematical argument. It's purely a intuitive view of why we are attracted to it. It's almost an aesthetic argument. So we're attracted to Shannon information because of its its elegance, uh, maybe its compressibility. Um, yes. We're 
but the other reason that we seem to be using it is almost like um, uh, I'm drawing an analogy with like um, if like a software platform is large enough, it attracts more developers. And so it's like it has like a yeah. tradition of like, you know, great minds working on proving theorems and it's like an army of people. And so it is, it is a pl platform that, that's a good one. It's a very good example with one difference that this platform is really superior. <laughs> Right, so it's like having multiple APIs, and but there's an API that's really better than others, um, and uh, allows you to do more things with uh, with no more cost. So, so I, I like the example because I do think that science works a bit like that. You're completely right. So there are things in science where you use this formalism or this formalism. And um, very nice examples, of course, um, in James Gleick books, uh, James Gleick, Gleick's book on Feynman. Um, he talks about how Feynman and Schwinger were competing for supremacy about how to do quantum electrodynamics. And it was really fascinating to see that the formalism started out with Schwinger, Schwinger's formalism, very, very abstract formalism. And then people moved more and more to Feynman's, which seemed to be equivalent. Uh, but the point was that it was easy to see why it's working or what it's doing rather. Um, so yes, there is this phenomenon that there is a user basis for science. I agree. But in the case of Shen, it is really, this one can do more. So it's actually, like, it's actually like as if that and the operating system actually um, does have less spaghetti code is more like uh, what they call like self-transparent code um where yeah. like you, you you can tell basically the function just by like looking at it and so it's got more of a kind of interpretability partially because of the, the elegance of its expression i mean we need to look at also what what these other types of entropies mean right so one very elegant trick that um i do actually is it's complete heuristic it's not really a, a hard trick but for people who start working with information theory one trick that i liked to do is when i want to understand the nature of something um in information theory there's this craft inequality and the craft inequality tells you gives you an inequality on prefix codes and you can now actually derive or motivate it's not really a derivation it's not a hard mathematical derivation but can motivate the choice of the term for entropy uh, by using craft inequality to ask what's the best the shortest code i can use on average to encode a, a, a um, random source assuming that the cost of encoding something is grows linear with the letters this linearity gives you shen if you choose a different dependence so if additional letters make it cheaper relatively cheaper or ex more expensive to create long codes you get different types of entropies so in other words you could imagine that as you build your code it gets more and more unstable when it becomes longer. So longer strings become more difficult to maintain, more more difficult to keep um, keep um, uh, how I say undamaged. And if that's the case, you get different types of entropies. Okay, so then different terms become optimal. So if that's the case, if we discover some weak nonlinear effects in, um, for example, DNA code where long long dna strands become essentially super linearly um sensitive sens sensitive to damage or uh, sublinearly sensitive to damage you would get other terms so, whether, um, so if you get something like a error catastrophe or there's some sort of built into the dna some sort of like i don't know like parity code for like um like error correction, these would be cases where, would those be cases of that kind or would those not be? I would not say um, error correction counts because error correction is exactly what you use to make sure that um, your code actually covers what it's supposed to cover. What it means is that making longer strings becomes cheaper or becomes more difficult to, to maintain. So longer mm -hmm. strings are more unstable. 
or they are uh, more stable for some reason. You could imagine that too. All these cases, well, there's no reason to assume this is the case. So, so to come back to DNA, so I could see like, um, on the one hand, like the longer the DNA is, um, that itself would have like some issues, potentially things like exposure or some types of maybe vulnerability to some sorts, sorts of mechanical damage. But then you could have another case where it's like a longer strain, could, a longer like sequence could like maybe fold in on itself, like wrap around proteins yes. in a way. So it would be like, would that be an example or? That would be an example. I mean, you probably could cover that with with uh, Shen code too, because you would say, okay, this nonlinearity then appears in 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 uh, excess entropy or in various uh, in information quantities, but it is an indicator of whether it's apt to use a, a variation of Shannon's entropy. So what what people do when when they argue about Rennie or Salas entropies, they they look for situations where there is some kind of non long distance um, nonlinear interaction that's um, that may be better traded using one of these variations of entropy. Um, as I say, um, I personally think that in terms of equipment of theorems that allowed us to understand what's going on, I find the trend to be the most transparent, but of course, I, I work on that. So, so this is the, your mileage may vary and that's definitely, um open open field for people who may find some really cool properties of these uh, generalizations of uh, Shen entropy. Mm. Yeah, it's it's very important for me to emphasize that. I mean, there is often this this view in science where you say, "Oh, this is the right way to do things, and this is the wrong way to do things." Uh, this is this is never right. Okay, I, I I don't I don't believe in that. I believe that. Science, the whole point of science is that you have these different lines of exploration. You never know which line of exploration is ending up going to do the big breakthrough. Nobody ever knows that uh, until it happens. And lines may actually uh, be a sideline for many, many, many years, centuries, even uh, thousands of years before they blow up. We know this. I mean, uh, we talked earlier about Archimedes and Archimedes essentially discovered infinitesimal calculus, or some aspects of it at least. And it took two, well, one half thousand years before it became uh, interesting to science again, right? So nobody can predict which part of science is the one worth investing in. And this is my opinion, also one of the issues we face when we look at modern science uh, and the way science is treated as like it has to give results which are immediately converted to a product because we never know which part of our science may be the internet of tomorrow or the steam engine of tomorrow we simply don't know that it's it's not possible to say that i mean there are more promising ones and less promising ones of course but of course nobody could say i mean at the the turn of the past century uh, people did number theory and um, they they were happy that it had no applications. I mean, there's a famous notorious quote by Hardy and uh, number theory, no applications, great. And today, when you pay online, it is number theory that protects your credit card from being, credit card number from being stolen. So I would say- it seems I like mean, it's an interesting, like, I don't know, a, a challenging dynamic balance to be had there and that like on the one hand you know, it's, it's good to be able to you know produce meaningful change via helping to further technologies and applications it's it's good to have um lingua francas like kind of like you're saying like with shannon entropy like having more people involved you can get more like progressive but then if you over exploit prematurely um, then you might be stuck on a, a local maxima that's not very high and you have no idea. Or there, there might've been some peak you never hit. So it's like, what's the right balance? Um, <laughs> well, this is always a question, right? What's the right balance? To be honest, um, there's no right balance. The point is the advice we can give to, to new scientists in a field is, you know, look what others are doing and and learn from it but don't become uh you know um don't don't make yourself slave of this um this master mode if you like 
right? I mean, uh, I'm, I'm choosing this term almost intentionally because it's, it comes from the theory of, of um, synergetics question. You have a, you know, large scale um, mode and uh, individual modes. And the large scale mode basically imposes its structure on the low scale mode. So as a scientist, you have to fight this. You have to fight back. You have to, um, you know, not, not because of rebelliousness, not because you want to be contrarian, but because you want to understand, okay, where does this big question have holes? Where has the mainstream? Where is the mainstream not actually doing its job? Okay, if it does a job, there's nothing to be said, okay? Right, if, if, if you have a theory and the theory just, just solves stuff, end of story, right? Don't waste your time on that. Uh, but sometimes it sits uneasily. And um, my recommendation to, to young scientists always, if you feel something sits uneasily, something is not quite right, something has is not well explained, something, paradox has one way of doing that, but paradox has a little bit, you know, uh, like putting, putting um, nails on your seat. It, it, it's, it's not just sadistic uneasily. It's just, okay, I will make sure that you don't sit easily. But there are these things where it's not obvious uh, that it sits uneasily. And this is where usually the interesting questions in science uh, can be found. I uh, found that a consistent pattern in um, finding good questions to operate on. And in particular in evolution, uh, the thing that I mentioned earlier, this was one of the things that drove me to ask, okay, how do actually organisms discover do organisms discover that they should have sensors that detect certain type of modalities? Where does it come from? How do they open this open up the space which may be quite hidden if you don't know to look there? And um, that that is kind of again something that sat uneasily with me and uh, drove my uh, interest in that. It's just an example for a much. Well, I mean, I think that's a perfect segue. I think we should dig into that. So, so if I'm understanding you, you were talking about this um, enslaving principle of synergetics. Um, is that uh, Haken? Is that his name? Haken, yes. Haken. Haken. Yes. Haken. And you'll have like these slower, um, more encompassing um, eigenmodes or modes of the system that um, will have, because of their of greater stability and consistency, will have this asymmetric power to uh, stay on top of uh, smaller flows and bring them uh, into the fold. And this is a, a good thing in that you can get basically a kind of, um, I think what you call like renormalization, but you can get like order from this, you get integration, but this can come at the expense of differentiation. So you can end up like reducing the extent of your, you can end up having like an anemic search or being like having excessively low complexity. And so like the idea is like you're using this sense of something not right, almost like a generalized predictive coding and you're part of the great belief web and you're like breaking free. He's like, that's not right. You're registering your prediction error. And you're like saying, no, um, I'm going to, I'm going to pass this message on and I'm going to, because it's not sitting right with me. Something like that. With a Yes, yes, yes. Uh, it's nice uh, how you put it as a prediction error. Maybe it is a prediction error. I think it's more uh, on a meta level. So that's why I find it a, a little bit difficult to to imagine. But I think I think the thinking as a prediction error is actually good. Good way to put it. Yeah, you predict something on a meta level, uh, or you and, and it's kind of not as simple as you expected, or it's not consistent. It's more of a consistency measure. Right, and so it's it's not that it's not simple. It's more it's not consistent. You you say it, it should be valid here and here and here, and then it turns out no, it's not. It's 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 somehow inconsistent in a, in a subtle way. And these are the things where you start wondering, okay, what's going on here? And in my opinion, the big breakthroughs, and especially in, in say um, sciences that are not mathematics but more physics and the like so they're kind of quantitative but but still formal enough that you can do that they they offer this uh, opportunity a lot to investigate although i do suspect that mathematics has these things too um because if you ask uh, how people like curing or Gödel found their their system breaking rule principles um it appears that they might have seen something that doesn't just fit, right? It, it's kind of sits outside of the of the of the realm of the system. They felt okay, it doesn't fit in. 
and um, into the details of your story, but do you think, um, in terms of like the, I don't know, like the, the psycho history of science, could it be the case that like there are some people who might be like, um, they might be tuned to be maybe a little bit like excessively sensitive to error, and maybe it's like uh, there are some kinds of false positives that will happen from this, but then if they're like part of a broader community, they're like. I don't know, the canaries in the coal mines are the people helping you to like break free of like Kuhnian paradigms or like to, to, to not uh, be overly narrowly chasing local maxima, but like someone, uh, it could even be a little bit of like a, like a broken clock is, is right twice a day. But like, yeah, I mean, of course you, you have, you have what we call, you know, uh, the, the crack uh, which, um, Actually, I talked about just today about about that. Why why do most crackpots actually usually attack Einstein? And nobody else. They don't attack von Neumann. They don't attack Feynman. They don't attack Hawking. They don't attack. They attack Einstein and almost nobody else. Sometimes they they talk about Newton, but but usually it's Einstein. And in my opinion, the reason is because Einstein was looks like an outsider. He has this career where he was not in the mainstream academia and then managed to break in with his crazy ideas so uh, while all the others were mainstream academia they were really brilliant i mean for neumann you the more you read about him the more you understand that this guy as they said must have been an alien that just pretends to be a human um and the the problem that you face is the following that if you look at the history of science scientists usually did not try to break out of the mold. They try to, I have this thing and I'm trying to understand it and and I have to break it. That's actually not so good, right? Galilei actually had a lot of problems because of that. We know this, right? He, he popularized, of course, the Copernican way of looking at things. He popularized the empirical way of doing things. And because he was not very diplomatic, uh, he got into trouble. I mean, he might have avoided the trouble saying what he wanted to say, being a little bit more diplomatic, but this is, not our point here, the point is that this idea that you have to eradicate what happened before is very modern. If you would say, what distinguishes modernism from everything that came before is this thing that wiping out what existed before is actually constantly a good thing, right? You, you have this in, in religious, uh, in religious um, boosts of religious fervor where you have this uh, uh, iconoclastic picture but usually it appears and then disappears again and it's gone and it, it comes and it disappears uh, in science um this has become since einstein in fact um essentially einstein the quantum mechanics but mostly einstein this has become like oh people want to do that now i there's a quote in in galilei Gal uh, the, the 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 life of of galilei uh, of by bertolt brecht the, the German the German playwright where he says where Galilei is being quoted as saying I don't want to change what we know really I want it to be as we know it and only if evidence becomes really 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 so strong that we cannot anymore live with what we thought it would be only then I say I'm so sorry we have to adopt my theory so in other words whether Galilei said that or not, we don't know. But the idea is that he sets a threshold for changing a paradigm very hard. You don't want to change a paradigm. You want to save your old ones. And you only change it when, OK, we have to give it up. We must give it up. Um, the big problem with giving up paradigms is that it's not always clear what to get instead. It's a bit like a, a, a smartphone, right? When your smartphone breaks and you want to buy a new one, you, you say, okay, yeah, there's a huge selection. Which one? This is a little bit better. This is a little bit better. This is a 5G, 4G, 6G, laser, laser gun, plasma gun, um, battery keeps for a month, a nuclear battery. I don't know. I'm just inventing. The point is... It's a big space. That's a very big design space, all the combinatorics there. It's a big design space and the value function is not very, very unclear. So... It would be helpful what, to have some kind of formal foundation in lingua franca for handling a diverse range of systems. 
that's one thing. I mean, what the good scientists usually can are able to do, they have some kind of built-in filter for th stuff that's complete nonsense and stuff that could go. I mean, they may get it wrong, but th this is not the point. The point is that the pre-filter is pretty good. So if they get it wrong, they get it wrong in an intelligent way. And again, I, I quote an example from history. I think I'm a little bit sorry that today we actually veer off towards history, but um, Sommerfeld uh, had this, this relativistic theory uh, version of Bohr's um, theory of the atom. And we know that it didn't go anywhere, right? I, I mean, it, it was a dead end, but it predicted some aspects of the spectral lines of atoms, correct? And uh, one of my professors called that um, a genius way of being wrong, uh, a genius way of being wrong. It was a very clever idea that, okay, went nowhere, but it was a good way of going nowhere. It was, it was a clever way of going nowhere. And that because it predicted some things correctly, people start asking, okay, what did it get right? What, what, what is the reason that although being fundamentally wrong, some of the predictions actually captured correct aspects of reality? So we have to ask ourselves a little bit, um, why can we do science? And what are the features of the scientific universe that actually make us capable of making predictions that hold water for longer than 20 minutes or a couple of weeks? Because that is the thing that distinguishes humans from animals. I mean, we more and more it's clear that humans and animals are actually not that different. If you would take humans and take deprive them of language and culture and everything, put them somewhere in the forest, probably would band together, they probably would survive, probably could do the, the, the stuff that uh, our ancestors did. But question is, um, what is it that allowed humans to scale up their ability to predict, the ability to cooperate across large swathes of humans? It's such an incredibly, accurate and, and, um, and, and um, effective level. That is a totally, totally um, surprising, totally surprising uh, phenomenon. So it seems like you're describing a way, it's like, it's like a very special case of being uh, wrong. So someone might be uh, wrong for the right reasons, but in this case, it's not just that, but it's like, were shockingly, even though you were wrong, you were also able to predict and model and compress a given set of data or phenomena. And so then there's, well, why were you able to do that? And so then you're actually pointing to some sort of major opportunity actually for uh, change, for like refining your, your worldview. And if you were able to get purchase on something uh, significant, but for reasons other than you expected, this this is like implying like an, a major opportunity for for model refinement for information gain. But then it's like uh, I'm I'm seeing like even more um, and then of a species of these like the nature of intelligent behavior, where it's like we know we're we're actually in this situation of always being wrong, always being it's just um, ri ridiculous how impoverished what we have available to us in some ways. Yet we're able to make so much with it, but we're also doing so in this like heuristic way. But why are these heuristics so powerful? Yes, <laughs> the heuristic is completely, it's unreasonably powerful. That's the point, right? You see, there's no, I can imagine a world where life emerges and then you get bacteria and they, they float around, they, they have this olfactory combinatorics of chemistry. Which is, by the way, very interesting too, because chemistry is the main combinatorial component in the whole thing. It's not physics. Physics is not combinatorial, but it's chemistry. Um, so you have the bacteria floating around, looking for the stuff, and that's it. And then, and, and there's no nothing beyond that, and that's fine. And you can get very far with that. Um, okay, now you you go out, you get multicellular organisms, you get prokaryo um, uh, eukaryotes, and, and and you climb up the the. The evolutionary ladder okay you get dinosaurs they were around for a long time i mean a long time right they were longer around than than you know 
that the queen was saying something. Um, sorry, I, I couldn't resist, right? So two, uh, 100 million years, 200 million, well, a long time. So it could have continued like that. Dinosaurs going around um, doing their stuff. They were wiped out. You had another boost of, of organisms. Okay, the mammals took over different types of uh, body, body model and, and life model, etc. And Homo erectus, as uh, Harari tells us, uh, for example, in his book, you, you know, one million years, two million years, it can go on. Suddenly something happens, something very weird. Nobody really knows exactly what. Uh, we can wildly speculate. I have actually wild speculation, which is totally unfounded, totally unfounded. But um, 70 years ago, hmm? You're going to have to tell me that you can't just get away with that. We, 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 yeah, yeah, of course. I, 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 this, was, this was a nasty cliffhanger. I, I, will, I will tell you in a second, but, uh, you know, it's uh, like good uh, storyteller. You always should leave some... some uh, Fence is killing me. <laughs> uh, some uh, uh, lines unresolved uh, immediately, and you'll, you drag them out. So something happens. We don't know exactly perhaps 70,000 years ago, if that's true, if, if culture basically starts evolving 70,000 years ago, suddenly something happens. And we have this, this complete change of how information is being processed. Information is not anymore the domain of an individual organism that tries to survive individually. Suddenly, you get this concept of, say, call it language. And you are able, a meme becomes an entity in its own, it travels from agent to agent, from organism, for individual to individual, can travel across, can change, can change slightly in, 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 in character. And you get to a point where you get to a point where suddenly knowledge is an entity in itself. And the reach through becomes essentially infinite. Not infinite, but as, as, as far as, as uh, the population of humans that can communicate goes. I think this is the reason why civilization works. Why this happens, why this is possible, I don't know. But I would say this transition that means become suddenly portable, that means become mobile. This is the key of civilizatory advancement. Yep, so it's not just fire. Fire certainly was important, but it seems that there was no new evidence that fire may have been known a million years ago. So fire was not the kickstart of civilization, which is, uh, you know, a little bit disappointing in a way. We would have hoped so. Maybe it was kickstarted for the brain, but not for civilization. Um, so what was kickstarter for civilization? We still don't know. Do you think, to what extent would the principles be more akin to um I don't know, like, i'm trying to think of like analogies and play from places where i can borrow principles and so one would be like the origins of um life based on genetic inheritance as being like a new regime getting started and then the other would be like i guess the cambrian ex so i guess there's that one there's multicellularity and then maybe like the cambrian explosion and maybe the, like there's another one of, of maybe along the way of like learning systems evolving like certain like capacities but like i think learning is very old i think learning is very old so learning itself i don't think is, is very new uh what what's new is is the ability to transfer it's like the ability to transfer dna from a to b created this this percolation of of uh, genetic knowledge it was evolution of a language of a genetic language that could would was universal and i think that is a major breakthrough that was a big game changer and i think for language that my bet would be on that this is the big, big game changer it was not fire um the wheel probably not, not not either i don't think the wheel was was uh wheel was very cool but we know that the wheel for example did not was not really discovered as a major tool by the uh, mesoamerican cultures they had it as a toy, but never as a as a tool. They still and had cumulative culture. They still had, they still had cumulative culture evolution. Like, and they did not have the wheel. Exactly. <laughs> and and we know it can't be fire, even though it might have been a necessary condition. Was it a random? Like, it might be a necessary condition for getting like, uh, your ticket of entry in terms of a brain large enough to support the the 
you know, certain types of communication and symbolic sense making. But we also, though, uh, know that that can't be sufficient because you know the, the timelines. And so then the question is, what was this like? What was this uh, toehold that allowed this new kind of bootstrapping to be made possible? Um, I've, I've actually been thinking a lot about that question um, in some of the uh, work I'm doing, trying to understand like mechanisms of psychedelics, um, contemplating whether like some of those mechanisms might, um, uh, that psychedelic pathways might overlap with some of these mechanisms that were part of cognitive modernity. Not necessarily involving like, so some people have like speculated that like we specifically were in a kind of symbiotic relationship with um, hallucinogenic fungi. Not necessarily that, um, but although maybe at times that was important, like akin to like, it's like the Baldwin effect, like learning driving evolution, but it's just maybe an opportunity for, for major um, sources of, cont of control parameters. Certain things like for, for a couple um, easily rapidly evolvable pathways that could get you a big change something like enhanced imaginative capacity. Like I remember you saying like the first human um, was the one um, thinking of flight and like the, the think of these impossibilities. And so part of what I'm wondering is like this, some kind of um, enhanced imaginative capacity allowing for a sense of counterfactuals which could allow for things like shared symbols and the kinds of sense making that would go into um, different forms of linguistic communication. Like to be able to, um, you know, that and what you might mean if I said this or that or that, and then, you know, the latent variables of your, of your mind trying to experience those vividly, even though I have no access to them uh, directly, except through like a bunch of, uh, some, sometimes uh, not so subtle, sometimes more subtle cues. Anyway, I mean, Tom, Tom Ray, um, uh, the inventor of Tierra, once gave a very interesting talk in Nashville about the effect of various drugs on um, mental states, so dissociations and, and which part of the brain became actually dominant. Um, he said he would be writing a paper on that. I have no idea whether he actually ended up doing so, but the point was is exactly what you say, right? You could experiment, factorize out different parts of the brain doing different roles, like controlling yourself or doing executing things or or being yourself as a as an entity rather than multiple use um which is of course also an interesting phenomenon what what does it mean when you split up what 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 does it actually tell us about the concept of me what does it tell us about the concept of me when this does not happen right is it multiple me's is it is it um uh, is the split a real split or just um, different filters through which a single single entity expresses itself? We don't know. I may, I'm also not working in this field, but the idea of, of um, using imagination to move away from what is and what I can do to what I could do um, is definitely a major step ahead. And I do think that this is something that we can also understand. Yeah, I, I think this is something we can actually um, um, partly model to some extent. I want to get into that more, but before we do, you, you were telling your story though of like what wasn't sitting right with you about the, 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 the nails you were sitting, you, you found uh, stimulating your being into questioning um, a certain common perspective that eventually led to empowerment. There, there, there are many of them. Empowerment, empowerment is a particularly, particularly problematic one, because I was the 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 main, many roads that lead to empowerment. And um, when I retro retroactively reconstruct where it came from, um, the more I think, the more I see. Right. Um, and I never know, is it really what inspired me? I know the concrete thing that inspired me. And that is actually surprising um, and not obvious. It was actually RoboCop, right? You know, robotic football. So you have this robot and you have this little agent moving around and can go to the ball and can kick the ball. It's a two-dimensional simulation. 
And I was wondering, that was, uh, I can't say give you the year, it was 2003, when I started thinking about the expression, um, um, it was 2003, I was thinking, is it possible for that agent to know to go to the bowl without me telling it to go to the bowl? Okay, so what is special about being close to the bowl that is um, not measured by distance? So I don't want to tell the agent, go to the bowl by minimizing distance because well, if I do that, there's no surprise, right? I know I know this is good, but but they but how should the agent know on its own? And of course we know now the answer, but it took me then some time to understand that the thing that makes the difference between being far from the ball and close to the ball is that when you're far from the ball, all you can do is change yourself. You can move yourself, nothing else. You're close to the ball, you can also move the ball. And the closer to the ball you have, the more you can move the ball together with yourself in the same time. And that's basically it. That's a whole story. Okay. Later, it became clear to me that this um, uh, could be modeled. Um, that was uh, basically um, after Alexander Klubin started uh, developing his uh, Bayesian network model for information processing in agents, minimal model. Um, um, we looked at that and said, well, this is perfect. This, this Bayesian model, network model, is perfect to implement this, this idea of, of changing this object. Of course, the rest is history, right? I mean, the, the rest just just came up, fell out of it like, like you know, like an avalanche. It was obvious how to do it. It was obvious how to compute it. I mean, it's not trivial and it's, it's difficult to compute, but but the conceptual part was not very com complicated once you had these things in place. Later, it became clear that other things might might have influenced me. So one thing that definitely will have influenced me is. Um, when I was a student, I looked at control theory. And in control theory, you have observability and controllability. Okay. So, um, and of course, very clearly, empowerment is a controllability measure, observable controllability. So, how many, much you can control that you can observe. And that is very clear once you look retroactively. Yeah, of course, that makes sense. We've later found psychological literature that talks about, you know, um, choosing options or uh, creating vari var variation um, like Österreich or Seligman, basically where you say, okay, they don't call empowerment, but they talk about helplessness. And empowerment is its counterpart. It's a di dialectic counterpart. Seligman's so learned um, helplessness is the dialectic counterpart of empowerment. Yes. And, and you're just saying now about observability and controllability. I believe you expressed last time, like um, empowerment, it's not just you, you know the ways in which you have purchased, but rather it's not just that you have purchased, but you have to know it. Yes. I'm wondering, so, so that's related to that connection. Yeah. And now that's I'm, why also, we I'm, also, yeah, I'm, I'm finding another thread. So that's why you brought up in terms of this kind of seeming paradox of empowerment of when ultimately you have to, there's a point where you have to trade it off and you don't just yes. optionality. So that's why you use the example of when you kick the ball and it's moving away from you, you've done this. Okay. Cause that's actually the origins of the idea. Or that's part of it, and and but but from all this, the origins of the idea, it sounds like it's partially just actually visualizing in a kind of detailed way, actually like really like imagining in a rich way what is this thing I'm trying to understand, and then doing that within that domain. Empowerment kind of came out of it. You were like, what is actually going on here with these robots, and yes. actually like running out different imagined like detailed simulations of what's happening, and that. That move, it's, it's, it's really interesting, like how like, it seems like a lot of great ideas in science were kind of like, 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 like Einstein's thought experiments, right? Like, what are those other than that? Like, he, uh, apparently, like, his maths were terrible, I've heard. I, I couldn't evaluate this, but like, his gift was the gift of imagination, of like, clearly visualizing things. But let's keep going. <laughs> yeah, uh, who, which scientist did you say? I, I didn't Einstein, get it. apparently, like, I, his, yeah. uh, I heard his, like, his maths were terrible. But his gift was the gift, really the gift of imagination. Like, yeah, I mean, he had to learn the differential geometry. So he was not th thinking structurally at all. He was thinking um, in terms of uh, physical concepts. And uh, when you look at, at for example, um, uh, I once listened to a talk about uh, how he developed general relativity. It went in several steps. There were several var variations of that and before he got to the final equations. And 
he basically toyed around with with indices a bit like it was like assembler coding right fixing fixing this uh, fixing that but he knew what he wanted to see at the end he knew what properties this system should have so he he would fiddle around with a technique he would not talk about the right structures if, if you if you would talk in the language of computer science you would say he didn't use the right data structures but he fiddle around with the code until it would do what he wanted it to do. That that was that was his his gift. He he actually was able to do that. <laughs> this is definitely not obvious that it's possible. Um, conceptually, I think um, it's much harder to do that these days, right? Um, most most of the top notch um, um, mathematical physicists are they just have to know the math. And the concepts of math to be make make productive uh, physical predictions, but you know you never know. You never know. You have then, then these people with this unbelievable um, imagination, and they know what they want, and they make they force the math to do what it what they wanted to do. Um, I, I, brought, I, I partially brought up Einstein because it seemed like an apt analogy. Partially because you primed me from earlier, but also because in some ways I think it's also. Um, a potential reference class that is not unapt for, I think, the importance of these ideas. So, like, what did intelligence do to the world? Yes. Like, it changed. You know, we we're asking this question. Like, it changed everything. You know, cities grew up out of the ground. Footsteps appeared on the moon. Uh, you know, and so if we can understand these principles more deeply with respect to ourselves and maybe artificial systems, we are looking at. Um, implications that are potentially as far reaching as those that would come from fundamental physics. It's absolutely. a- Absolutely, a very good point. What did intelligence do to the world? It completely changed how it looks. I mean, we call this time Anthropocene. That is, on one hand, it's self-aggrandizing. On the other hand, it's true. I mean, whether or not um, climate change is going to do a very very bad change to the world uh we don't know but probably it's not good but the point is that yes our ability to have this collective civiliz civilizatory intelligence is definitely powerful now what we don't have and everybody blames humans for being for being stupid or something, but I, I don't I don't think it's it's entirely fair. I mean, it's it's not that long ago that we went out from the, the jungle, not the jungle, probably the steppe or something. But um, humans are animals. That we actually managed to get that, to that point here is totally like okay, how did we do that actually? To um, keep going with Einsteinian metaphors, it's like yeah, how did we achieve critical mass? Or to uh, it's probably apocryphal, but you know, uh, the most powerful force in the world is compound interest. How did we get to this regime of like information being able to kick free and accumulate on itself um, to uh, earn interest with itself? I think we just froze. But that is so how do we get there? But now we have these carved horse problems. Uh, there's a good amount of intelligence required even to get to some of these more advanced regimes, but. The principles are going to still be operative the whole way through, but the question is, how do we get to this point where we could do these um, something as sophisticated as, as, as linguistic communication, as something as sophisticated, like, how, how do you get there? And so enter empowerment, enter fundamental drives. I think we need we need a model. I mean, Jürgen Schmidhuber has this idea of um, increasing compression efficiency, right? So you compress, you have the stream of, of stuff that comes up and you compress better and better. And I like this idea. I think, I think there's something to it. The one problem I have with it is that where does the compression machinery come from? What, what makes this machinery do the compression in the first place? That is the question. There's no reason that the software machinery needs to exist. Then why? What for? That is the actual question of emergence of intelligence. So I do think that compression does happen. It's not always obvious. It also needs to choose the right directions, which is not obvious because if you have just naive compression, it's all asymptotic. And asymptotics is, can be arbitrarily bad, but it can be so bad that it can take 10 times to the power of 13 uh, of the life of our universe 
for it to, uh, you know, for it to actually uh, emerge. So it is much more efficient than that. Why? This is a big question. And what is it exactly the thing that makes it go into this overdrive mode? I completely agree with you. Nobody knows this. And in my opinion, that is a big question that we'd like to know. I mean, people talk about the singularity in the future. I want to understand the singularities in the past. Mm. Yeah, that makes uh, at least two of us. Um, so the with Jürgen Schmidt Huber's work in terms of like intelligence's compressibility and curious, artificially curious agents. Um, it's interesting that eventually I think he has an architecture he calls power play, which is like this agent like exoning uh, or exoning, exploring along this like zone of proximal development where it can further um, do its meta learning and refine its knowledge. But it's so there might be in terms of in, so I, I believe even Jurgen like acknowledges like it's not just the intrinsic value of information that's being optimized for. It's not all artificial curiosity. Like he'll grant like there's some extrinsic drives to like basic like homeostatic set points and things like this. But are there some people who would argue that um, empowerment would be derived from artificial curiosity and that you could do everything with just like curiosity? Or would anyone I think, say that? I think people always confound empowerment and curiosity. It's it's not about curiosity, right? So maybe there are elements of empowerment which drive curiosity, but curiosity is not the main driver. And uh, I do think that the whole argument of curiosity is a little bit too much um, primed by the fact that it's scientists doing the work. So scientists are curious people. Um, most people are not that curious, and, uh, unless it is about, you know, looking at watching reality shows, right? They're curious about who goes with, and that is not curiosity, it's, it's something else. The reason why people observe other people's uh, private drama is, in my opinion, um, to either gain power or to learn for themselves or to see whose partner is uh, possibly available if uh, they break up. That's my personal theory. So if, when people gossip, uh, one reason they do so is it's about power. It's about understanding um, what's going on with me. Do I learn from that? Is it something I should avoid? Um, are these people, or maybe, you know, um, I, I, I've been a bit cynical here. I, I should probably <laughs> be- even honest. scientists aren't equally curious about all things. And it is interesting the directions in which our curiosity flows oftentimes are involved in what allows us to basically maintain our agency in the future in terms of having options. And yes. so it's some, and, and, and there's this whole thing upstream of it, which is what allowed you to be curious to begin with? Like there's like a card horse thing, like you're assuming a system that has a certain type of dynamical stability and, and reservoir that it can like draw from to do these explorations. Like you, you're assuming like there has been some like, you know, there's enough energy, there's enough free energy to, to work or there's enough energy to work with here. And this, this is a good point, right? So you can afford to be curious if you have that en enough free energy, right? If you are working uh, in a Manchester capitalistic uh, kind of, um, kind of factory, you have no curiosity, just want to survive, just want to get enough food to feed your family. That's all you want. Um, so curiosity is, is a luxury. And let's not forget, curiosity killed the cat, as we say. So curiosity per se is not necessarily value. What happens is, in my opinion, it could be a runaway effect originally, actually. So it could be that actually curiosity is not the thing you want in principle. You don't actually care about curiosity. You don't need to be curious to survive. You can be you know, a housefly its curiosity is probably limited to finding stuff that that smells and it can sit down on your nose your sandwich the trash on the on the ground outside this is what the, the fly is interested in it's not really curious it just wants that right so being interested in in things may be actually a side effect of um 
of some other type of information acquisition, right? I keep I keep um, making this reference to this piggyback effect that I, I well we hypothesize is might be a, an effect that can predict some some developments. And um, the piggyback effect is that if you want to get information, certain type of information, there are effects uh, the, in the bottleneck which forces you to take in more information that the information we're looking for. So think of it: you you order something at a big a big uh, delivery company, uh, you know, you know, remote delivery. They deliver this to you, and the the object you want is this object, but it's packed in styrofoam and and layers and layers of packages. Think of that like this: so you get a lot of information that you never asked for, just because you wanted the thing. And now, if you are in an evolutionary context, and I always argue in an evolutionary context here, um, then. You, this is wasteful. Evolution doesn't like to waste. Okay, it does, really doesn't like to waste. And so there are two things that can happen. Two, one thing is that you evolve that to be less and less and less. You try to reduce the amount of fluff until everything fits, fits uh, you know, flush. And, uh, you know, it's a shrink, shrink wrap. And exactly, perfectly fitting. You're sitting in your niche and you're in your niche and you stay there forever. You're a turtle, you're a shark, you're a fly. Perfect. Nothing to be changed. Leave it like that for 300 million years. Two, you evolve... Bayesian to... model reduction via phylogeny. Something like that. Potentially with overfitting. <laughs> um, probably not. I don't think evolution overfits so easily, right? Because that is very fragile. If you overfit, you're dead. Yeah, so so evolution actually, um, I mean, overfitting in evolution is always uh, has a temporal scale, but if you live for 300 million years, that's pretty good, doing well. You it's went extinct overfit. eventually, your, your, your line went extinct eventually, but that's a good run. The dinosaurs did pretty well. <laughs> yeah, it's a good run. 300 million years is a good run. So you did something right, right? So, you know, if, if you, let's also not forget one thing. You, you have traders that live in the bull's market and do really well. And everybody, oh, you're so brilliant. I want to learn from you. And the bull's market runs and runs and runs and it's still doing well. And suddenly the market becomes a bear's market. Yeah, the trades change. And these traders suddenly are out of luck. Nothing works anymore for them. Now, are these traders bad? No, they were good in their niche while the market was a bull market. In the bear's market, traders will make survive that are bear's traders. And some traders can switch, many cannot. And ideally, and, they can stay solvent long enough to make it through these fluctuations. Yes, where, you can do where, that. Where the times where their, their strategy is the optimal one can benefit. And so when they, they're, they're extremely well fitted to the, the bull market. And so ideally when the bear market comes, they, have, they survive that enough that they can then capitalize on their unique strengths for uh, bull markets even in, in, while they survive the bear. Huh. It's interesting with like, that, that I think it's like a really like crucial thing, like curiosity killed the cat. Like it's, it, curiosity is not this unequivocal good. And ultimately, and I'm again thinking of like, that's quit by Stuart Russell, like you're, you're not gonna be able to fetch the coffee if you're dead. You're not gonna be able to be curious very long either if you're dead. And so there does have to be a kind of like um, a prioritization that uh, keeps you from uh, what would be like, not to be like uh, losing ergodicity, but like keeps you from finding yourself in areas of state space from which you will not recover and you will not be able to um, occupy again. Um, so it's like, I'm kind of like, and so I'm thinking of like myself as like a scientist, my own psychohistory, like, so starting out, you know, I'm, I assume I had a rattle and I shook it mightily. And this was some like combination of like, empowerment and curiosity drives a little bit of like my grip and, and and this like maximizing the causal information between my actuators and my sensors but also a little bit of like well what's going to happen if i do this and, exactly and and they're um and then later at different points different ones might be kind of taking the lead almost in like a kind of like meta learn value function where it's like there's like initial the drives enter in one way but then they keep coming back because they're they're basically their cybernetic universality classes. So it's like you, you they're continuous with like the more like implementational level realization, like the evolutionary 
priors or, or meta priors, the inductive biases, but they're also going to be not just tethered like developmentally, but they'll be re-derived again because the same principles will keep applying. And so it's like later I become, so it's like I'm, uh, my empowerment doesn't feel quite on. Everything feels a little bit weird because I'm like a, a weird, lonely, neurotic kid. And so then like, I, I'm like, and I, and I don't feel empowered. And so then like I compensate by trying to create this niche for myself as a nerd where I figure these things out and curiosity becomes, but partially it was curiosity for the sake of empowerment, for the sake of being able to have like a purchase in the world. But then eventually it becomes like this end in and of itself, almost like a, like even to a fault, even to a point of like where it ends up sometimes even undermining itself because you got to hold down a job if you're going to keep being curious. And so you're going to need to have like, you need to keep moving between these. And so like, let's say you're just like naively curious. You won't be able to be naively curious forever. You'll be that cat because you need to plan ahead. You need to be able to survive the, the ins and outs of when that's the best strategy of like mad dog curiosity. Maybe that's good, but you need to be attending to the empowerment enough that you can make it, that you can, that you can afford to do that. I mean, empowerment can be used to, to uh, ask curious questions because empowerment is, requires a forward model. And if your forward model is not accurate, right? Then you have a lot of noise, right? So you can't predict and your empowerment is low. So curiosity, if you can figure out that this causal influence that you have here is reliably creating an effect, then you increase your empowerment. And of course, to find that you need some kind of curiosity. In other words, empowerment does encourage curiosity sometimes. Sometimes, not in general, sometimes. So for example, um, if you discover uh, in a game, you discover different things, then usually game design is like that. So that things that should be tried stand out. They are kind of obvious or that they invite you to play with them. So you play with them and find out, oh, if I press this button, then uh, it rains or if I press this button, that comes a fire, fire hose or whatever it is, right? So you, you learn the mapping and you learn that it's reliable, hopefully, right? If it's not reliable, by the way, empowerment is low, right? So if you do something that is not always working, you have to understand, do I actually spend time on making my skill more accurate or not? So let's assume the first person who learned to throw a stone. If I threw a stone, killed, killed, the, the, killed the rabbit, could catch the rabbit, although the, it's almost impossible to catch rabbits. Now that person thinks, okay, is throwing something I can actually practice and become better? Because you could imagine you don't get better at it. Yeah, you can simply not throw stones more accurate. If you would practice throwing stones underwater, forget about that. It's not going to work. This is not a technique that works. But in air, you can make throwing stones very reliable. And you can become better at it and increase your empowerment. So it's a mixture of curiosity and uh, of competence development. You, you develop competence, reliable competence, very important, reliable competence. Because I think that one of the striking things that organisms at the prime of their vitality is that whatever they do can be done with reliability or they feel like they are reliable what they do is reliable so when right? you have mastery over a domain when you have grip when you have purchase you're actually able to perform reliable experiments but your your epistemic gain is going to be low if you don't have that reliable grip you can't actually even like perform the experiments generate the the the, the, the data that you would want for that that generating the data is the phase when you're learning when you want to exploit your empowerment you need reliability right so if you have i'll give you an example this is an experiment that 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 probably needs to be done right if i give you a, a joystick and you have to control a game and this joystick has lots of noise i think you would really hate to play that even if you somehow can make it do what you want in the end, but you would really test that. It's no fun to play that, right? You, 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 if it's very difficult to play, but it's reliable and you know that if I do this, I can make it do this, 
people will practice it and become very, very good. I mean, people do practice playing difficult instruments. People do practice doing difficult juggling. People practice doing extremely difficult stuff. If they feel they can become arbitrarily competent at that. If they don't feel that, they don't bother. Of course, if like, you're, for example, if, if, if with that joystick, like eventually you're going to require to, for instance, the, the glitchiness of it has to fall away. Like, like, like you have to figure out some sort of like, you have to be able to refine your policies enough to actually like work with it. And then, it, then you're, you're back to this place of being able to use it. But yes. if, you, if you, if that never happens, let's say it's like a, a constantly moving target of like where the glitchiness enters. Yes. That's a, so, so, so that's a joystick. So you might adjust to like a car that's like, you know, there's some sort of way you have to like nuance it because the power steering isn't quite working, but it's just like, you just had to learn its ways, then it's fine. Yeah. But, but if it's that's constantly right. yeah. moving on you and you can never do that and you never feel your grip shoring up, you're going to yeah. get, that's going to get old quickly. That's going to be actually a kind of torture. Yeah. It's not only torture. You don't just don't invest in that. So, um, if you, for example, um, if you, it's you can see see these things in the introduction of new weaponry, when when you made the, the England made the transition to the uh, Welsh longbow, this was a major step ahead. The Welsh longbow was an extremely uh, powerful weapon, and um, you could train it to a very high level of standard of ability, right? So. The, you know, the short bows, they have a short distance and not much effect. And oh, I don't know how accurate they were. But the point is, when you have something like a longbow and you can train and you can become arbitrarily good, it's worth investing. And then you will have people that say it's the king says, OK, uh, all, all sports are banned except a longbow training. Um, but this is worth doing because if people train for 20 years on the longbow, they are actually effective archers. So. I claim that if there is a fundamental noise in your instrument, you will not spend more energy learning that than this noise actually gives you, right? You will not spend what you might do. And this is very interesting is you might say, but what if I could reduce that noise? You ask yourself, could I somehow improve that instrument or the tool so this noise goes away and then i can improve my skills to work with this less noisy system so i'm seeing this as like a general model of cognitive development and niche construction uh, via, yes. and so it's like you're in like just trying to play to your strengths to leverage what can be leveraged and to find better ways of leveraging it. So it's like that you might, so you, you might learn how to, how to tune um, the instruments, the, you might learn how to, uh, but you're going to need some sort of realizable path, which then though creates this um, yes, yes. feedback and creates like the development yes. of skill, which will then influence like the range of basically um, approximately profitable policies that you could pursue. Yes. Then influence what that range is, what you yes. pursue, and then, and, and this will basically carve you out as a particular system with a particular set of affordances and a, a particular personality, if you will. Yes. And the key is that you don't know where you'll end up with, right? So there are two, two elements of the noise. One is you are incompetence the second is the system's incompetence and um the, they basically is you want to reduce both of course right if the system's incompetence or noise let's say, say is low then you can you will spend most of your time improving your ability or that that's what you could invest in you might decide i'm not going to do longbows i'm going to uh, play an instrument, uh, playing the harp, or I'm, I'm going to become a cook or whatever. But but if you if you move into the retractor of improving your longbow expertise, you will get to a point at which you reach the limit. I mean, of course, there may be people who were uh, 
practice less, but but basically, if you are competent, a master, you want to become a master, you become as good as the system allows you to do. And now you can say, okay, this longbow has reached what I need. I would like it to be able also to do this. Then you go to a longbow maker and tell him that. And you know, a competent, let's talk again about a master longbow maker says, ah, I see what you want. If we change this and this, we can squeeze out this extra distance or this extra precision. And this is exactly what you do when you debug stuff. You say, oh, I don't like this software because it doesn't do this. I would like it to do that. Although software is a bit tricky because software is digital. So the, the properties are a little, little bit more difficult to characterize. But in principle, you have this pressure of competence on the user side and on the instrument maker side, if you like. In evolution, there is a big question whether, I mean, of course, the, in, in the standard, um, standard view of evolution, there's always just selection. But maybe there is a feedback that certain skills are being used, are being needed, you know, an epigenetic feedback or something like that, which makes it easier for uh, organisms to um, feed back into the morphogenesis or into the into the user pattern of, of, of whatever whatever competent skill they're trying to use to make that more valuable, possibly over generations. Most certainly in the individual. We do know that. I mean, within, within a generation, it's just like like literally, your morphology actually will change. Like, if there's a type of, like, there's like a, like a type of, like you're you're working the longbow, um, your motor skills will change, but your your, your musculature will change. You'll build up yeah. calluses, and this will be, um, which will then allow you to engage differently, and then this yeah. creates you as a source of basically demand. Um, because yes. it's now part of how you make it in the world. So then you go to your the supplier of the demand, the law, and then on their end, they're adjusting their offering, which will then further adjust the demand for the offering because of, you profit then from well-designed longbows, but then there are going to be more longbow makers. And so there's this kind of, so this is now reminding me of the uh, chicken egg problem of cumulative culture and language where it's, um, it, so like Chomsky, for instance, arguing like initially maybe we use language for thought and that's like the toehold. But then the question is like, what's the good of being, having linguistic virtuosity if you're not within like a community of practice of language users? And so it's like, there's, it seems like it has a very similar relation. And I guess the one more place I'm maybe seeing a potential parallel, I don't know if this works, but like um, sexual selection, like somehow it's like this gave natural, yep. this gave evolution an ability to like, do this sort of estimation of what's going to be like this basically is letting you put in more requests to the longbow maker or, or the adaptation like you're specifically yes. able to refine them with, with, with the kind of more of a teleological flair to it and i do think that uh, charles darwin that's why i always say darwin was not a naive darwinist right he really understood that the selection is a relatively weak uh, feedback and he needed a stronger feedback. And uh, he, he realized that sexual selection co-opts organisms as helpers of evolution, right? It makes, it uses organistic, organism, organisms intelligence to direct uh, evolution. Evolution is borrowing our eyes and ears and sensors. We, we've given evolution eyes with sexual selection. Uh, yeah, eyes and brains. Yeah, well, the whole thing. We've given evolution world models. We've... Yeah, and it got it, it can go wrong. It does go wrong. We know that, that there are dead ends. But um, this is like empowerment. I mean, I had this question today about empowerment. So a, a colleague asked me about that. Oh, what is it? it can't it just close the loop in itself, become solipsistic? I said, of course it can. And, and, you know, there are people who don't do anything else but playing video games all day. I mean, that's exactly what it is, right? You sit in this little loop and you get really competent in this little loop. And that's fine for these people as long as there's no external world that impinges on them, right? So we could live in the matrix and be happy 
and every everybody's doing their stuff and then uh, there's a meteorite falling on earth destroying earth and the whole thing goes goes off so you so it, it, yeah so it, it, doesn't this disprove empowerment no exactly this is something that does happen within like modernity is made possible yeah yes and it, it, it might not even be modernity I mean, even in nature, you have a, a proto examples for that. Um, and I'm not sure it's a, it's a good example for that, but you have examples where things just, um, where you add, 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 end up in, in minimal, minimal feedback, feedback loops, parasitic, parasitic organisms, for example, have this, right? They get rid of shit, everything they need and, and just sit in their little uh, perception action niche and that's good enough for them. And, and that's all you need to do. And they can forget everything else. And as long as it works, it's, it works, right? What empowerment just together with evolution claims, what's empower, how empowerment hypothesis claims is nothing else but that the niche is such that act, actors, and sensory, uh, actor, actors and sensors want to match. And if they don't match, they try to get matching Either the sensor becomes smaller, the actuators becomes bigger. Um, you you adapt them so that you sit on the best, best trade of curve with energy, or else, or else you devolve them, you you reduce them, you, you get rid of the sensors that you can't act, activate. Think of 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 cave fish. Fish in caves don't have light, and then they can't use their eyes at all, and therefore they basically become blind because they, they need, you know, the, the, the line organ or some other organ, but not the eyes. The alternative solution is fish that live in deep sea. It's also very dark there, but because of the bigger um, ecological niche, they were able to co-opt bacteria that would generate light, and thereby the eyes became valuable again. So there are different solutions. This is not a unique solution, but this, the main statement is that empowerment as an evolutionary drive tells you, you want to actually have an impedance match of sensors and actuators. If there's, that's not there, you have an evolutionary drive to make the match, and you have also an individual agent's drive to make the match. The individual agent wants to be in the niche where they match. Impedance matching, which is making me think of the importance of variability for achieving this. And so now I'm going to want to have a conversation with you about the natures of matching, because I'm wondering the extent to which, like, um, how much of the of this account, um, these forms of resonance aren't uh, of, and coupling and decoupling, not just things that would come online after life, but maybe part of even like moving from something like auto autocatalytic sets to the origins of life. Um, so I'm wondering like how far back we can go with what you're describing here. Um, but we should um, save that for another day because we've run out of time. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think that's a very good question. That's an excellent cliffhanger, uh, second cliffhanger for today. So we have two cliffhangers. I, I probably won't remember, but I'm sure you will. I will. And... Uh, I do think I do think that's an excellent question. Nobody really knows uh, if empowerment at all is a valid valid hypothesis, right? So if if there's a way of establishing that, it's a very good question. Where did it all start? Where what's the first thing you need to get there? And that is an open question. So uh, we continue. Sorry, we continue. We will continue. Yes, indeed. Uh, thank you so much for the time and looking forward to next time. Thank you.